44 crore people, if I'm right, are uh, included in the Jandan. And uh, at a time when we all thought they're going to be zero balance accounts, but still we wanted them to be included. Today they surprise us with more than 1.40 lakh crores as, in, as deposits in their accounts. It was the pandemic time. For months, the economy was in a standstill. Millions lost their jobs. Still, money in the bank accounts of the poor remains untouched. Jandan bank accounts were opened specifically to transfer government benefits directly to the poor. But not even a single rupee was withdrawn from most of the accounts. During COVID, there were at least three occasions where it was found that money which had been put into the banks, that's part of the digital transaction. The whole fintech thing works on this so that money has been put into their accounts and now they have to withdraw the accounts. And they found that they've actually not withdrawn. 84% of these have only done one transaction in two years. And if this is the amount that is not being withdrawn and she was expecting it to be zero, you would think that they will be looking at why this happened. Instead, what we have is a push saying everything is DBT. An article in The Wire explains this dilemma with an anecdote. A woman in Patna gets a government subsidy in her bank account to build toilet, but she never used the money because she didn't know about it. The account was opened with the help of an agent a long time ago to get a job under a rural employment scheme which she never got. And she forgot about it. She has no smartphone and changes phone numbers frequently to reduce the cost of mobile recharge. Welcome to the curious world of Indian finance. Millions unable to withdraw their own money is just the tip of it. Tall claims of Digital India and Aadhaar 2.0 is another. The buzzword now is cryptocurrency and the government of India is also signing it. What's actually brewing? That's an interesting hell of a story. Welcome to the money train. Digital transactions are on the rise, even if the majority of India still doesn't understand a thing about it. We may disagree about the exact figure, but the growth rate is huge and the government is devising new methods to force more people into digital transactions. Why? Because it's fast, it's easy and most importantly traceable. Digital transactions leave footprints which can be tracked back to its owners. That includes terrorist groups, drug cartels and tax evaders. Every enemy of the state can be tracked down more efficiently. But the enemy of the state list is never complete. Countries well ahead in digitizing money have demonstrated it. The WikiLeaks of Julian Assange is denied contributions for more than a decade. Financial intermediaries like Visa and Mastercard just refuse to transfer money. Truck drivers in Canada protesting against the government are also facing it now. Last week, Russia found itself out of the cross-border payment network known as SWIFT. Sanctions against the war-crazy Russia is just and hence legit, some may argue. But the problem with sanctions in the digital world is that it happens so fast according to the whims and fancies of the imposter. Tomorrow it can be any other country or any other person. By just a click, you are out of the system. And if you are inside the system, the keepers know everything you do. You think about what fast tag means. They say that, you know, they penalize you if you do not get a fast tag. So it's not a matter of convenience. Only. It is also that you're penalized. If you don't have a fast tag, then you pay double what everybody else pays. And across the country today with highways going the way it is, there are... You know, there is this, uh, at every at regular intervals, you have to announce that you are crossing that place because you, NPCI will get information that you have crossed that place. It's a tracking of people. So there is a tracking of money. There is a tracking of people. Rewind to 2009, the launch of Atha, world's largest identification system. The biometric data collection was presented as a standalone system which will be used for nothing else. But today, Aadhaar is a stepping stone to a multi-billion business opportunity. Mobile phone owners verified by Aadhaar and financial transactions happening from those phones are its premises. The father of Aadhaar, Nandan Nilekani, himself brags about it. This is the only place in the planet where you have a situation where the credentials are now going to come from two public factors. There's no one else. The phone replaces the card and the pin continues. But in the second phase, you will use an Aadhaar authentication on your phone using either your fingerprint 
or your iris. So you are able to create two-factor authentication without getting into credential management. Which means two guys in the garage or in the KSR incubator can build an Apple Pay experience. Think about the implications of that. Huge information available about the financial transactions is where the big money lies. Financial technology companies so far were just service providers. A new class of providers will provide transactions for free because the data they are going to get from that activity is, is monetizable. And you are going to have APIs, right come on? Machine readable APIs to say I as a business, I hereby allow capital flow to take all my voice details for the last six months. Get me alone. So fundamentally, when every invoice is on tap, 5 million invoices a month, look at the kind of data you're going to get. And your ability to find out what's going wrong is going to be very, very quick. If suddenly you find these invoices are slowing down, you know the guy's sales are going down. If suddenly you find his AR is mounting, you know he has a problem with collection. So your ability on a real-time basis to figure out whether the company is doing well or badly is going to dramatically go up. You don't have to wait for 5 years and have it to NPAs, which is what we have in India. Better understanding of the customers is what every business wants. It's legit. But the price society and the individual have to pay sometimes can be too much. I'm talking about you know, facilitating people to have bank accounts, which is how they started. They have moved far away from it now. And it is getting into a financial system, which means not just that they are in the service delivery of these systems. That's not why they are here but that they are in the control of how monies get spent, how monies move, how people use these monies, they are in that, in that control space. So with a mobile phone, they say that they need the telecom companies now to be reporting regularly on all those telephone numbers which have become defunct or which may be allotted to other people so that these companies will know. That is, everyone should be working for this fintech, never mind what it does to the rights of people. And, you know, in the, when they first began with the UID documents and then it went on up to even 2016, they were still talking about there being the need for a law. And they were, talk, they were saying that privacy is important, but we'll come to it later. At least they were acknowledging that it was an issue. Today, you find that they are talking only about security of the data. So they're no longer concerned about what happens to people's privacy? Now, the safety of the person, and you, when you read the deepening digital uh, transactions, you'll find that it's stated there that, you know, there are a lot of transactions that might fail. There are transactions, you know, people may not know what to do. So we need to create, you know, a, a dispute resolution structure. Nothing exists today. But you are having financial, you know, fintech companies working all over the place. And what does the government want? The same thing, information about everybody but for a different reason. It's called maintaining law and order in the face and actually means controlling the society. And a state with dictatorial ambitions will always be looking for enemies among its own people. And then the cryptocurrency happened, not owned or controlled by any government. It can cross national borders as easy as taking a walk in the neighborhood. Big money is flowing in and the governments are confused. Should we accept it and take advantage or ban it? Let's understand first what this whole business of cryptocurrency is. It stems from the concept called blockchain. Data in digital form is stored in a computer or a server. If connected to a network, it can be accessed by many, but the authenticated source remains in one place. It also means that if you want to delete or modify the data, you need access to that single source alone. Anybody in control of that source can do it. To steal some money, hacking into the bank's data storage facility is enough. Blockchain is an antidote to this threat. Instead of storing data in one source, it's stored in multiple sources that are part of the network. To make any change in the data, the change should be made in all the sources to validate it. So, without a general consensus, altering data is impossible. Thus, by decentralization of information, its security is ensured. The information thus secured can be about anything. It's so secure that it can be even considered as a currency for transactions. Simply put, this is what cryptocurrency is all about. In the beginning, it was used for shady deals, but now it's gaining more acceptance. Cryptocurrency has many names, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Tether. About 6,000 such currencies exist and the list is still growing. 
The value is also spiking. The new currency takes the government out of the system, but everybody cannot step in. Making of cryptocurrencies called mining needs huge hardware support or you have to purchase it, means the common man has no place there. It's yet another system devised to make the rich even richer and powerful. Political decentralization of the participants is very, very doubtful. So who can participate in this kind of a uh, cryptocurrency mining? People who have computers, people who have uh, resources, people who can run these programs. Uh, certainly a normal person sitting out there cannot participate in it. So just by designing the protocol in this way, uh, there is a certain political centralization that automatically happens. So At the last count, 600 million of us are your friends. Crypto is definitely heading the internet way where few tech giants call the shots. And the union government has almost legalized it by taxing it at 30%. A currency predominantly used to fund drug deals and other such shady things gets a legitimate place in the high table. And now the Indian government has dreams of its own digital currency. It is therefore proposed to introduce digital rupee using blockchain and other technologies to be issued by the Reserve Bank of India starting 2022 and 23. It's not clear what the finance minister has in mind. Cryptocurrency is based on eliminating one single power center. And when the Indian government rolls out its own currency, what does that mean? Consensus is inapplicable when there's a single authority. Consensus has no meaning. For example, when Election Commission of India is the sole authority to decide what votes are cast, and who is the winner and so on and so forth. So there is no question of a consensus. So blockchain doesn't even apply in, in such a situation. Uh, same with asset registers, uh, same with digital rupee. You know, if Reserve Bank of India is the only authority that, uh, that governs that rupee, whatever that rupee is, where is the question of consensus coming in? So that's a, that's a difficult thing to understand. As of now, there is clarity in just one thing. The government doesn't want to be left out in the new race. All other things can be filled in later because data is money, data is king, data is God itself. A very serious situation, but the entire scenario has been diminished into a debate between efficiency and privacy. If you want efficient, fast facilities, why not allow to be get tracked? What's going to happen? But when big business opportunities combined with big power concentrations, what you are going to lose is not just privacy but your freedom. Freedom, which is to be written and remembered in capital bold letters. And now, some other important news from the financial world. Reliance takes over Big Bazaar. In a surprise move on February 25th night, most of the retail shops were occupied by Reliance employees and the customers were requested to leave. Future retail group which owns Big Bazaar had sold it to Reliance but the deal got stuck in a legal battle. Amazon challenged the sale for contractual violations. Now as the physical possession gone, Amazon is reported to be looking for an out of the court settlement. Fuel price hike is expected this week. Even if international prices soared, state elections had prevented union government from doing it. Last phase of voting ends on March 7. Soon after that, a hike of minimum 12 rupees is predicted. Mocking the government, Rahul Gandhi tweeted, Hurry, Modi's election offer is soon going to end. India's poor yet to come out from the pandemic-induced economic disaster. A survey revealed that 66% of economically vulnerable households has less income compared to pre-COVID times. 60% income is less than half. Households with debt more than 50,000 rupees is 21%. And only 34% have enough food grains to eat. The findings are part of Hunger Watch report released by Right to Food campaign. Russia may be heading for its first ever default on sovereign hard currency debt. Foreign investors are stuck with their holdings of ruble-denominated bonds after the Russian Central Bank halted coupon payments and the settlement system Euroclear stopped accepting Russian assets. Much of Moscow's $640 billion reserves are frozen by the West and the sanctions are also affecting international capital inflows. Ukraine seems to be benefiting from cryptocurrencies. The government had legalized cryptocurrency just before war and crowdfunding is flowing into the country. According to the blockchain analytics firm Elliptic, Ukraine has raised more than $24 million in cryptocurrency donations so far.
What's your guess on the fuel price hike? 10 rupees? 15? 20? Anyway, the myth that it's the market forces that decide the price is busted. We leave you with that thought. See you again next time. <music>